Hi, I'm Russ of Aquarimax. Welcome to Your First Tank. This is a video series that will help you set up your first aquarium successfully. Filters, heaters, and lights can be thought of as the life support systems of your aquarium. Before we go any further, here's a safety tip. Because all of these devices require electricity to run, it's important to pay attention to all instructions from the manufacturer on installation and use. One of the most important of these is the drip loop. A drip loop is basically a low point in the cord that runs from the device down to below the outlet and then back up to the outlet. This protects from water that might drip down the cord. Instead of dripping into the outlet or the power strip, it drips down onto the floor where it can do relatively little harm. Years ago, I experienced the consequences of not making a drip loop. Water dripped down the cord and into a power strip, which began to smoke and short out. If I hadn't caught it in time, there could have been a fire. Now, needless to say, I'm a lot more careful about making sure that I use a drip loop. And now, on to filtration. Although there are many types of effective filters available these days, a hob, which stands for hang on back filter, is a great choice for your first tank. This type of filter is effective, reasonably priced, and relatively easy to install and maintain. Although there are many brands and models of hang-on-the-back filters, they all share certain characteristics. Basically, an impeller is a small spinning device which draws water up through the uplift tube and into the filter box. Once in the filter box, the water passes through a sponge or pad of some type which traps particles. This process is known as mechanical filtration. The water may then pass through activated carbon or various other materials that chemically trap unwanted substances in the water. This is known as chemical filtration. The final stage of filtration, known as biological filtration, occurs where there is a wheel, a pad, a sponge, or other material that provides large amounts of surface area. This surface area provides a home for the beneficial bacteria that are able to process ammonia into much less toxic nitrate. Most filters are clearly labeled as being suited for a particular tank size. Make sure to get a filter that is large enough for your tank size. You may even want to go a little larger. In other words, if your tank is a 20 gallon tank, you may want to get a filter that's rated for 30 to 35 gallons. Hang on the back filters differ somewhat in the specifics of how they are set up, but they usually include very clear and simple instructions. Once your filter is assembled, you may need to add water to the filter box to prime it. Most hang-on-the-back filters can be damaged if they're run completely dry. Make sure that the water level of the aquarium is maintained high enough that the filter can do its job properly. The portion of the filter, whether it be a sponge, a pad, or a cartridge, that provides mechanical filtration will need to be rinsed or replaced periodically. The frequency with which it needs to be replaced varies depending on many factors how many fish you have in the tank, the make and model of the filter, and the size of the filter in relation to the tank. The amount you feed your fish also plays a role. Some manufacturers recommend that the pad be replaced every month, though with a good rinse you can often extend the lifespan of these disposable portions of your filter. The uplift tube and the impeller will also need to be cleaned periodically, as accumulated gunk will definitely decrease their effectiveness over time. If you notice a significant decrease in the amount of water flow going through your filter, it's probably time to perform some filter maintenance. As mentioned before, the portion of the filter that is designed to provide biological filtration is usually the last stage in the filtration process. This part of the filter should require minimal maintenance, and in fact, should never be rinsed with tap water or water of extreme temperatures, as such an action would damage the beneficial bacterial colonies that you work so hard to cultivate. I will, of course, provide more information about these beneficial bacterial colonies in the episode on cycling. Those are the basics on filtration for now, but I should address a question that many beginners often have. Do you need an air stone and an air pump? Well, the simple answer is probably not. Now, while an air stone won't really do any damage, the water movement that it produces is also produced by your hang on the back filter. So in most cases, an air stone is not necessary, and it can make a little more noise than a hang on the back filter and also splash water onto the bottom of your aquarium cover where it may leave deposits. Now, there are definitely some situations where I do use an air pump. For example, for hatching baby bind shrimp. 
or providing a little water movement for a Daphnia colony. However, in most cases, as a beginner, your first tank doesn't need one. Now let's talk about heating. There are a number of aquarium fish that can do just fine in room temperature water, but many of the community fish that you're likely to keep in your first tank are tropical fish and do better with the stability that a heater can provide. Choose a heater that has the correct wattage for your aquarium. For example, in this 20 gallon tank, I'm using a 50 watt heater. I know that the fairly warm, stable temperature in the house year round is enough that 50 watts will suffice for this aquarium. If I were keeping this aquarium in a cool basement, however, I might need to increase the wattage somewhat. For larger tanks, there are a couple of advantages to heating the tank with two heaters, each of lower wattage. The first is that if one heater stops producing heat, the other heater will be producing some heat until you're able to replace the other, rather than getting too cold. And the other is that if one heater sticks in the on position, it probably won't produce enough heat to cook your fish. These days, most heaters on the market are completely submersible, but it's always a good idea to check. Heaters are typically mounted to the glass with suction cups. The best way to get the suction cups to create a long-lasting seal is to get them wet and then push them onto the glass when the, the uh, suction cup itself is not immersed in water yet. Ideally, you should put your heater in an area with a good amount of water flow. Next to the filter is a great place. Most heaters also have a minimum water level. If you place the heater low enough in the tank, you'll be able to do a 25% water change while still maintaining the minimum water level for the heater. Most heaters need to adjust to the aquarium water temperature before you even plug them in. Consult the instructions to find out how long you should wait. A good temperature range for many of the fish that you're likely to keep in your first tank is between 75 and 78 degrees Fahrenheit. This is one of many areas of fish keeping where patience is a virtue. It may take a while to adjust your aquarium heater to exactly the right temperature. Be sure to follow the manufacturer's instructions. You will, of course, need an aquarium thermometer. There are several makes and models available. Make sure to check it regularly while you're adjusting the temperature in your aquarium, and at least daily thereafter. Soon, the temperature will be stable, and you'll be one step closer to getting your fish. A couple of final heater tips. Never allow your heater to come in contact with the air while it's running. In fact, if you need to drain your tank for any reason, you should unplug the heater and allow it to cool before doing so. You should also avoid exposing the heater to any type of temperature extremes. For example, don't pour a stream of cold water directly onto the heater. Heaters exposed to the air or even water of a very different temperature can sometimes shatter. Those are the basics for heaters, so now let's move on to the aquarium cover. A cover for the aquarium serves several important purposes. It can help keep fish from jumping out. It can keep curious fingers or cats or other animals from getting in. It can help reduce evaporation, maintain temperature, keep the light fixture from being splashed, and protect the aquarium water from dust. There are a few different types of covers for aquariums. One is a complete cover that is integrated with a light fixture. It's all one piece. There are also hinged glass covers that allow you to choose which light fixture you want to use and even to upgrade one later if you decide to do so. Glass covers usually feature a plastic hinge down the middle, a small handle that you attach yourself, as well as a plastic strip that can be cut to customize it to accommodate filters, heaters, and other devices. Attach the handle according to manufacturer's instructions and bear in mind that the adhesive will need to cure for some time before it can be used. Use a ruler to determine where you will need to cut the plastic strip to accommodate your filter and other accessories. In this case, I needed to cut off about six inches to accommodate the filter and the heater cord. I generally use a utility knife to score the plastic strip on both sides and then gradually bend it until it snaps. Fitting the plastic strip onto the glass cover needs to be done carefully and gradually. Otherwise, you could break the cover or cut yourself. And now, onto lighting. The type of fixture you'll usually have with your first tank is either a simple fluorescent strip or an LED fixture. There are pros and cons to each type of fixture. A fluorescent fixture tends to be fairly inexpensive, provides a nice bright light. It usually is suitable for growing low light plants. The fluorescent tubes will need to be replaced every 6 to 12 months. You may not notice a dramatic decrease in light output, but the plants will. You can buy replacement tubes at a local pet shop, though I usually go to a local hardware store 
to buy daylight or sunlight bulbs, which will do the job and cost much less. The economy LED fixtures that you're likely to use for your first tank tend to be fairly inexpensive, although they still may cost a bit more than a fluorescent fixture. The light they produce may be a bit dimmer than fluorescent tubes and is less likely to be able to grow low light plants well. LEDs, in theory, do not need to be replaced for a long time. Unlike fluorescent bulbs, the output remains pretty constant over time, but sometimes the bulbs fail prematurely. Depending on the fixture you have, this may mean that you need to replace the entire fixture to replace the LED that has failed, or you may have a modular type that will allow you to replace individual LEDs in the array. If you have no live plants in your tank, you may choose to keep the aquarium lights off, except when you're looking at your fish. Now, fish typically do very well with just ambient lighting, so this won't be a problem for your fish and will actually discourage algae growth. If you have live plants in your tank, or you just rather have your tank illuminated throughout the day, aim for about 10 to 12 hours of lighting. You should avoid keeping the light on 24 hours a day for several reasons. First, it will encourage algae growth, and second, your fish appreciate a period of darkness for rest just as much as you do. Whatever type of light fixture you choose, I highly recommend that you invest in a simple, inexpensive light timer. You can set it and forget it, and your fish will benefit from the regularity of the light cycle. Eventually, if you find yourself interested in growing a wide variety of aquarium plants, you may need to upgrade your lighting. But for your first tank, those are the basics. The next episode will focus on cycling your tank cultivating those beneficial bacteria that will make your aquarium a suitable home for fish.